What's up, guys? Dr. Gabrielle Lyon here with not only my best friend and also my mentor, Dr. Donald Lehman. And today we're going to be talking about the trilemma. So, I'll, Don, I'm just going to let you take it from here. <laughs> so, that's a term that I first got. It, it relates to a lot of the discussion about agriculture and the role of animals and greenhouse gas emission. And the term was coined by uh, two authors, Tillman and Clark, in a Nature paper in 2014. And it, it basically says that agriculture has this delicate balancing act of how to balance the issue of climate effect, greenhouse gas emissions with good quality diet. You know, how we can have a diet that is all sugar, that has very little greenhouse gas emission, but obviously it's not healthy. Right. And so I always argue that when you really come down to this, this is a protein question. And we know that while animals do produce greenhouse gases, uh, it's like 3% compared to fossil fuels at around 85% of greenhouse gas. But animals also produce well over a third of the world's protein, <clears throat> and in the United States, almost 65% of dietary protein. So, you know, we have this, we have to start looking a little different into this trilemma, and how do we balance what agriculture does? How do we use land? How do we balance diet quality and things like that? So, the, you know, the, the first thing I always look at that people need to understand is the role of cattle in land use. Um, of the world's land, um, only 11% of the world's land is what we call irritable land, where you can actually do continuous crop production on it. And that is pretty much all in use. Um, and if you look at that in areas like the United States, for example, people don't realize that uh, the primary plants that we grow in the United States are grains, corn and wheat and soy. People think about a plant-based diet and they immediately thought, started thinking about vegetables and broccoli and cauliflower and, and avocados. It's important to recognize that 50% of the, of the U.S.'s fruits and 25% of the U.S.'s vegetables are already imported. And the number one cause of greenhouse gas in the U.S. is transportation. Right. And so, so, people, wait, wait, so before you go on, yeah. I think that the listeners really have to let that sink in because I know that, you know, our tribe is definitely pro-protein and I think that they come up against a lot of misinformation where they perhaps have a hard time saying, hey man, this is not the right way. So yeah. what you heard Don say is that the major issue with greenhouse gas is from transportation. It's not from agriculture. And in fact, those that are eating avocados while living in winter in Minnesota are actually contributing much more to greenhouse gas than if you're eating some local fruits, vegetables, whatever you can get your hands on or animals, you know? Yeah. The average food item in the United States travels 1,500 miles before it gets to your table. So that means eating local is really a, a big issue. The, um, what was I going to go with that? Um, uh, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. Um, the, other, the other thing to think about in this plant-based diet is I think when, I think, you know, Gabrielle and I would both agree that plants are a very healthy part of a diet. Totally but the, agree. Yeah. But the issue is if you go the climate change route, it's not vegetables and fruits that are available. It's wheat and corn and grain and rice. It's all of the stuff that makes junk foods. It's basically extra calories with almost no nutritional value. And most of the estimates are, are I mean, right now, the number one vegetable in the United States is French fries. <laughs> the number two is tomato sauce on, on pasta and pizza. And number three is lettuce. I mean, so nobody's eating vegetables and the one they eat, they're eating have almost no nutritional value. If we're going yeah. to increase our fruit and vegetable consumption, let's say we're going to try and double it. The estimates that are 100% of the fruits that we, if we're going to double the intake, 100% will have to be imported. And for vegetables, 50% would have to be imported. 
So those are all transportation right. issues. Yeah. And so it's interesting because I think that the biggest pushback is that people hear, again, it's this narrative yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that it's real. It's just yeah. a narrative. And, you know, we hear a lot about how um, cattle is bad for the environment. And I just think to myself, you know, we're really asking the wrong question. So if, yeah. if people believe that um, climate change is a problem, which I think everybody does, then the way in which we're going about it is kind of um, not looking either, A, we're not a asking the question appropriately, like what's causing it, which I think a lot of people are, yeah. or two, are we using other um, animals as a scapegoat because yeah. we just, you know, individuals feel that it is unethical to eat animals that we've been eating for 2 million years. Okay. Yeah. I, wanna, I wanna come back to cattle in just a minute, but one yeah. more thing about sort of, the the climate change the issue we've got to come to grips with the fact that cities and urban life is the reason i mean transportation electricity and industries make up over 85 percent of greenhouse gas in the united states and urban sprawl is eating up 175 acres of farmland per hour around the clock in the united states so grasslands and agricultural lands are the only way we can get rid of CO2. It's the only way we can sequester it, and urban sprawl is the problem. Let's get back to cattle for a minute, though. Cattle, though, like I said, only 11% of land is usable for crops. The rest of it, though, is usable for particularly ruminant animals like cattle, because they eat grasses and forages, and even, even things that we might throw away, like potato peels or distiller's waste from making, you know, beer or, or making gas haul for cars, um, cattle eat that and turn it into high quality protein. So it's, it's an upcycler. So upcycler. upcycler, which means for every 60 grams of protein ingested, they produce what, 100 grams of high quality protein? Exactly. Is that how those numbers, right? Okay. Yep. Exactly, right. and, and, and it's, even, it's even a more interesting complexity than that in that people say, well, the cattle are you know, putting out all this CO2 and methane, but it's actually not the cattle. It's the bacteria in their ruminant stomach. It's the bacteria that allow them to eat these grasses and forages and those bacteria ferment it. But the important thing about that is if the cow doesn't eat it and these grasses just rot in the field, or get put into rent landfill, the bacteria in those places will also produce CO2 and methane. And so what we now know is that about 75% of these greenhouse gases from cattle would be produced if cattle don't eat it. And so we're getting huge amounts of nutrition from cattle consuming these versus just letting it rot in the field. Mm -hmm. And so people have totally distorted these ideas. The other, the other thing to remember is people get all excited about plant-based protein, but the reality is protein in most plants is only about 50 to 60% bioavailable. But when you feed those plants the cattle, cattle break down, because, and the reason for that is the protein's bound to fiber, and we can't break down the fiber. But cattle will break down the fiber and make all of those amino acids available and they then upcycle it to make these high quality proteins. So ruminant animals play a massive role in, in both the US but in the world uh, economy of protein. And there's just simply no way we can't have them as part of our, of our protein system. I think this is all, it's just so valuable and so important and it really helps clear up the confusion. You know, I mean, listen, there is this trilemma. We do have issues with, you know, global warming and greenhouse gas production, but perhaps it's not what we think, you know, perhaps yeah. it's not. It's a, comp it's a very complicated topic. And the headlines are designed to evoke emotion and not transmit science or understanding. I lecture on this around the world and it's amazing how many misconceptions and 
you know, very biased types of comments that are out there. It is. And then one thing you can be certain of is the higher the emotional response, the lower the intellectual conversation becomes, right? And that's just the Absolutely. way it goes. And listen, you can think about that if you're getting into a fight with your significant other, the more emotion that comes out, the lower the intellectual uh, or, you know, intellectual IQ will then become. And so um, then it becomes a real challenging conversation. So yeah, absolutely. So, so is there more that you want to cover on the trilemma? You know, I think that, I think that's it. The, uh, you know, the point we started out with is that if you really look at the greenhouse gas, what that means is the solution is that we have to eat a lot more grains. We have to eat more corn, wheat, rice, uh, and sugar. Uh, vegetables produce pretty much the same or more greenhouse gas as milk and eggs. And cattle, uh, the reality is, uh, are, are totally distorted because of this natural forage decay. They're, they're consu the, the problem is, is they're held accountable uh, for their entire life span of eating when in fact, uh, it's totally distorted because of the grasses they're consuming. So anyway, it's uh, the the reality of the statement, plant-based diets are going to save the planet, is a totally distorted and misleading concept. Yep. I, you know, uh, totally agree with you, obviously. So yeah. listen, guys, if you like this video, like it, share it, comment it, comment on it. We'd love to hear your comments and your questions. I really try to answer everybody and I read all of them. So, you know, anyway, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, Dr. Donald Lehman, hit subscribe, share it. And uh, till next time.